Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this IPI Speaker Series event featuring His Royal Highness, Prince Turki bin Faisal Al Saud, Chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. A widely traveled and well-known representative of his country, Prince Turki, has for nearly 25 years, from 1977 until August of 2001, been the Director General of the General Intelligence Directorate, which is Saudi Arabia's main foreign intelligence service. In 2002, he became the Ambassador to the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, excuse me, and in 2005, he came to Washington as the ambassador to the United States. He retired in 2007. Founder and trustee of the King Faisal Foundation, he is also the chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, and a trustee of the Oxford Islamic Center at Oxford University, and the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University, which is also his alma mater. Prince Turki um, has frequently been at IPI, uh, particularly uh, for the Middle East dinner we give on the eve of the high-level week opening up the UN General Assembly. That's a dinner usually with more than 30 foreign ministers from the Middle East attending, and I'm happy to say that uh, Prince Turki has often been there. Um, he um, is also a member, and has been for 12 years, of IPI's International Advisory Council. Uh, he will speak to us for about 10 to 15 minutes on the general subject of Saudi Arabia and its role in these challenging times. Then he and I will converse for a short while longer, and then we will invite questions from the audience. Prince Turki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I thank IPI for giving me this opportunity to talk to such a distinguished audience. Across the street is the United Nations building, and the Kingdom is one of the founding members of the United Nations in 1945, and has been a very active player in what goes on, not only in that building, <coughs> but in many other places where the UN <coughs> plays a role. And it's not just in diplomacy but it's in the humanitarian works of the United Nations as well, and cultural uh, aspects of the UN. And uh, when my father signed the charter in 1945 in San Francisco, from then on, uh, for a long time, the uh, permanent representative of Saudi Arabia to the United Nations was Ambassador Jamil Baroudi. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was uh, originally from Lebanon. Uh, he was stuck here during the Second World War. And when my father came in 1943 to visit the United States, he was attached to him as a translator. And they formed a bond and a friendship, which led to my father asking Mr. Baroudi to be my guardian when I came to study here as a teenager in the 19, late 1950s and 1960s and subsequently at university. So uh, my attachment to the United Nations also comes from that aspect of uh, Saudi Arabia's attachment to the UN. And I remember visiting the UN many times while he was ambassador to be at the General Assembly or attend the delegates lounge, uh, luncheon or dinner, etc. cetera. Um, and the kingdoms, uh, role in the United Nations, I think, has been a constructive one, uh, not only in, in terms of providing uh, financial support to the activities of the United Nations, but also in being, uh, as I said, an active member in the debates and the goings-on of the United Nations. And uh, whether it is on Middle East issues or world affairs or cultural issues, uh, the <coughs> Kingdom uh, contributes, uh, I think, in a way that is uh, meaningful and that is um, very positive to help the United Nations get its work uh, done. 
one of the things, of course, that uh, uh, is very much on everybody's mind these days as far as the Middle East is concerned is the uh, Arab-Israeli peace. And as you know, the kingdom was uh, a major player in uh, promoting uh, peace uh, in the Arab world with Israel, not just from the Arab Peace <coughs> Initiative in 2002, but even before that, uh, maybe some of you will not remember, but there was the Fahad Peace Plan, which was presented in 1981 and 82 by the late King Fahad, which for the first time took into account that there is such a thing as a state of Israel in the midst, <coughs> in the midst of the Arab world um, after the uh, 1948 uh, struggle between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And so uh, that process of bringing peace to the Middle East has been um, uh, a hallmark of, of Saudi activity and Saudi support for the United Nations. Uh, more recently, of course, the kingdom has been a major player in another struggle that is going on in the Middle East um, in Syria. And uh, the kingdom with other Arab countries uh, back, I think, in, in 2012, uh, played a role in bringing a UN uh, bringing a proposal for a UN Security Council resolution that would have formed an interim government uh, to be uh, put in place, um, made up of uh, representatives from the government of Syria and the opposition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when that proposal came to the United Nations Security Council, it was vetoed by the Russian Federation and China. And uh, since then, of course, the situation in Syria um, uh, deteriorated and we've had more killings and more um, uh, refugees, etc., etc. But the kingdom is still an active member of the United Nations efforts uh, to bring peace to, uh, to Syria and is, has been present at the UN uh, uh, sponsored uh, meetings on Syria uh, many times. <clears throat> Another issue that is very much in the uh, work of the United Nations is the crisis in Yemen. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, uh, the kingdom uh, with the other Gulf states back in 2012 again, I think, were um, instrumental in uh, achieving a, some sort of, uh, of agreement between the various political forces in Yemen at the time to uh, replace the then president Ali Abdullah Saleh with his vice president and initiate a, a national dialogue that resulted in a, in a, um, a roadmap to bring peace to the Yemen uh, to which all parties were um, members, including the Houthis. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, when it came time to <coughs> implement uh, the roadmap at that time, uh, the Houthis chose to abrogate their, their agreements and try to take over militarily in, in Yemen. The legitimate government of Yemen at the time called for international support, and the kingdom and other countries came forward to provide that support. But also the UN Security Council issued Resolution 2216, which supported the legitimate government's um, requirements for peace in the Yemen and asked the Houthis to relinquish their military takeover of the Yemen and uh, return the weapons that they have taken from Yemeni armories and uh, generally go back to the negotiating table with the legitimate government. And the kingdom has been a supporter of the United Nations role in the Yemen and is uh, actively uh, in, uh, engaged in, the, in that effort. Um, the recent call by the United States and subsequently by the UK for a ceasefire has been supported by the coalition uh, that is led by Saudi Arabia and, and the United Arab Emirates. And I hope that they will reach some kind of uh, understanding by the end of the timetable that was defined as a means to get peace to, uh, to the Yemen. In terms of humanitarian aid to the Yemen, 
the kingdom has been in the forefront of countries to provide that, that humanitarian aid and to try to uh, meet the challenge that faces uh, the Yemeni people, not just of displacement, but also of warfare, where uh, inevitably there are going to be victims who are not necessarily to blame for what is happening in, uh, in the Yemen. Um, am I in time? No, or? please, continue on. Um, other issues, of course, that, that the kingdom has been very much engaged in, uh, with the, in world affairs, if you like, is uh, the issue of, of Iran. And uh, Iran, from the kingdom's uh, perspective, uh, provides uh, <coughs> a, a challenge uh, that is very much based on the Iranian revolution's philosophy of exporting the revolution. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Khomeini when he came into power in 1979, that was the, the banner headline of his success, that uh, he, will not only, he not only succeeded in toppling the Shah in Iran, but his aim was, and he said so publicly, was to topple all the other Shahs in the area and to export the revolution. And the Iranian extension into countries like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, and <coughs> other areas, including Afghanistan and other places, uh, comes from that extraterritorial ambition that Iran has been pursuing since uh, the revolution. Uh, the kingdom's relationship with Iran um, took the form of a seesaw uh, since the revolution uh, with uh, uh, dips and uh, um, rises uh, succeeding each other. In the mid-80s, uh, uh, Khomeini is uh, uh, dispatched pilgrims to the holy places in Saudi Arabia. And at uh, one of these uh, uh, pilgrims, uh, pilgrimages, uh, the Khomeini pilgrims, the <coughs> pilgrims decided to take over the holy mosque in Mecca. They were prevented and um, um, uh, lives were lost on both sides and the confrontation that took place there. Relations were broken between the kingdom and, and, uh, and Iran at the time. And as became a habit with, uh, with the Iranian authorities, um, the Saudi embassy at the time was sacked by, by mobs uh, in Tehran. Uh, and so the relations did not return until mid 1990s when the late president Rafsanjani uh, met with uh, the late King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia at a, an Islamic summit conference in, in Pakistan, and they decided to patch things up. And the highlight, if you like, or one of the higher um, uh, acmes of, of Saudi-Iranian uh, uh, relationship occurred in Rafsanjani's successor's term, uh, Muhammad Khatami, uh, when he... Uh, made a visit to the kingdom, official visit, and uh, there was actually um, a security pact that was signed uh, by both countries. Uh, one of the ironies of today's situation of the tense relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran is that the person who signed that security pact on the Iranian side was called Rouhani, uh, and he later became president of, uh, of Iran. Unfortunately, from that time on, after Khatami left office, uh, as I said, uh, Iran's extraterritorial ambitions uh, took over and uh, began to, so, to expand their interference in, in Arab affairs using uh, uh, organizations like the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and uh, fomenting uh, unrest in Bahrain and uh, in Iraq, of course, with the uh, American invasion and the destruction of the, of the Iraqi government at the time. The expansion of Iranian influence grew and uh, they enjoy a privileged position in, in Iraq uh, since 2003. Um, one of the uh, uh, noticeable developments of that is that when, uh, during the last government's term, 
and even before that, when Maliki was uh, was prime minister in um, in Iraq, uh, public demonstrations uh, occurred uh, starting in Basra. And those of you who know Iraq, uh, Basra is, if you like, the heartland of of Shia Iraq. And uh, those demonstrations uh, calling for a better governance uh, and uh, uh, improvement in the lives of the Iraqi people also uh, carried banners uh, saying Iran barra barra, uh, which means in Arabic, Iran, get out, get out. Uh, so it hasn't been that easy for the Iranians to uh, take advantage of the uh, privileged position that they have established in, uh, in Iraq. And today, uh, the, the formation of an Iraqi government is still a work in progress, and I hope they will succeed in achieving something uh, that will bring peace to, to Iraq. Uh, I'm being very brief in my presentation because there are many connotations and, and other uh, incidents that could take place and did take place in, in all these countries which affect Saudi, Saudi actions. Um, of course, uh, I cannot leave you without mentioning the, uh, the uh, tragic occurrence that happened uh, last month, uh, which was the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who uh, uh, is, uh, not only worked with me for, for some time as uh, embassy spokesman, first in London and then in Washington, but also was uh, um, an acquaintance, and I would say we had very uh, friendly relations uh, over the years. And uh, I described uh, his death uh, in a speech that I gave in Washington a couple of weeks back uh, uh, as coming from, from a verse in the Quran, which says that uh, the death of, or the killing of an innocent man is like the killing of all of humanity. And I think his death falls into that category. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the Saudi government has been uh, quite active in trying to uh, bring to, to, to not only its attention, but to the world attention, exactly what happened uh, in the Saudi consulate in, in Istanbul. And uh, they've been uh, engaged in uh, discussions with the Turkish authorities, and uh, I'm expecting them to live up to what they said, which is that they're going to put all the facts on the table. And uh, as soon as that is done, I think we can see uh, where the, the, the blame is and what all the other questions uh, that are um, in question at the moment. Uh, and uh, for me, that is uh, an indication that the kingdom wants to uh, show the, the rest of the world exactly what happened and uh, to go on from there and build on, hopefully, a better improvement, uh, not only in the conduct of, of Saudis, uh, in particular in the security forces, but also I think uh, for the image of, uh, of the kingdom, which has been tarnished by this uh, tragic and uh, extraordinarily painful uh, incident uh, in all of our lives. Uh, when I was in Washington, I remember a few weeks back, um, uh, King Salman's office called me and, uh, and instructed me to get in touch with Khashoggi's um, relatives who lived in Washington to convey to them his condolences. And I had the privilege of, of doing that. And subsequently, of course, he met with, uh, with Khashoggi's uh, eldest son who lives in Saudi Arabia and presented the, uh, the uh, condolences. I'm sure many of you may have seen uh, the interview that uh, uh, the two sons of Al Khashoggi gave uh, on CNN um, a week ago, I think, uh, and uh, how they interpret uh, their, their father's death and his murder. I will not speak for them, of course. They are, have done so already. Um, I will stop here and hopefully uh, receive questions from you that will further bring light uh, to 
what remains to be in many people's minds uh, a mystery, which is what Saudi Arabia does in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to talk for five or ten minutes and then open up to the floor for comment. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you about the last point you brought up, which was the, um, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and you have, in interviews in Washington, complained uh, that there is uh, intense media onslaught and people who would be demonizers of the of the kingdom have been saying lots of things. So uh, let me just ask you a question based on sort of stipulated facts. Um, uh, it is the fact that he died in Saudi, that's been acknowledged by the Saudis in the consulate in Istanbul. Um, uh, the killers were Saudis. Um, I think that's also been acknowledged. The, um, uh, the people who this has not been acknowledged, but there is photographic evidence that some of the people who showed up in Istanbul were in the presence um, of, the, of the consulate um, were people who have also been photographed in the entourage of, um, of, of Mohammed al Salman. Uh, and uh, so there's been speculation that he, <coughs> speculation combined with the fact that he is the powerful leader of Saudi Arabia, and it's hard to imagine something of this enormity happening without his knowing about it, or even approving it, as some people are saying. Um, the one thing that uh, there, is, there still is no explanation of whatever happened to the body. And the failure to talk about that, I would argue, is opening up um, opportunity for other people who are not friends of the kingdom to speculate uh, about things. And just today, we have a word from Turkey, a country that is a regional rival of Saudi Arabia, that uh, they have discovered um, uh, chemicals in a, a, in a well there by the consulate. And they use that to speculate that maybe his body was dissolved and that's how it disappeared. Um, the question I have is, uh, I, I take your point that you think the kingdom will finally um, explain everything they know. I guess my question is, why don't they do it now? Because the failure to do that now is leaving it open to the very kind of victimization that you've been complaining about. Well, to start with, uh, this is not the first time that uh, the kingdom has come in for a media sure. uh, take. Uh, um, and uh, I remember, um, maybe some of you old enough will remember the uh, the oil embargo in 1973, uh, when then equally um, not just uh, U.S. but other media sources in Europe and elsewhere uh, vilified the kingdom and uh, accused it of all sorts of uh, shenanigans and even demonic uh, action and so on. And I remember a, a very uh, uh, um, interesting article at the time that quoted so-called um, knowledgeable sources in the United States, which uh, stated that uh, the U.S. was uh, planning to, uh, to invade Saudi Arabia and uh, break the, the embargo uh, at that time. Uh, another uh, vilification process, of course, of Saudi Arabia happened um, in 9-11. We all remember that. Uh, it was another uh, tragic incident uh, where Saudis were equally involved and the kingdom came in to blame and some people accused uh, the kingdom of uh, not only uh, because these people were Saudis but of actually being the one behind the, uh, the attack on, on the Twin Towers. Uh, and all that, of course, uh, was uh, finally settled when, when the 9-11 Commission report came out uh, and uh, it showed that uh, the kingdom uh, the government and, and the leaders had nothing to do with, uh, with the situation there. Uh, and it took some time for the 9-11 for the Commission to reach that conclusion, uh, having to investigate all of, the, uh, re all of the happenings and all of the ramifications of, the, of that uh, uh, action. Um, uh, in, in Istanbul as well, yani I think, as I mentioned, yani the kingdom is, is proceeding to 
collect all of the information. And uh, media is not something that the kingdom does very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an example. Uh, I remember when uh, I was appointed ambassador uh, in London um, in 2003. It was a time uh, when uh, uh, five uh, Britons had been arrested in the kingdom for bootlegging. And the British press, you can imagine, came out with all of these fantastic stories about uh, how they were tortured and, uh, and uh, mistreated and etc., etc., in jail and so on. And uh, my superiors sent me a telegram soon after I arrived in London uh, saying, what are you doing about the British media? And my response was that I waited a couple of months to get the lay of the land and see how media and Britain um, acted, etc. And then uh, I sent back a telegram saying, you're absolutely right, the British media is awful to Saudi Arabia. But you should see how they treat their own government and their own royal family. And I think this is the, the role of the media is not just Saudi Arabia. But yeah, and I see what is happening in this country and how the media is divided and the contentious relationship between the president of this uh, country and, uh, and the media. My point here is that the media will do its stuff and it will seek sensation. And unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily always seek the truth. Uh, it relies on, as I mentioned, knowledgeable sources, without mentioning who those sources are. And sometimes it accepts speculation as fact and uh, uh, denies fact as propaganda. Uh, so uh, we're caught in that, in that vortex of, of media hype and, and media nature by itself, whether it is the print media or the, uh, the uh, uh, television, uh, television media. And the only way I can tell it to you is that, uh, yes, uh, we are terrible at dealing with the media. <laughs> that is something that has been um, a stigma of Saudi Arabia many years, and uh, I hope will not continue for long. Uh, we learn from, from these experiences. But uh, the truth is, you can never hide the truth. And, and the kingdom will never attempt to hide the truth, not just on this situation, but on other situations. Another factor, you know, um, uh, laying accusations at someone like uh, the crown prince in, in Saudi Arabia, without fact, yeah, that is pure speculation. And to say that the, the kingdom hasn't come out and, and said what is the truth and what is not the truth does not give you the right to accuse someone uh, of, uh, of something and uh, that has not happened and there is no proof on it. So uh, it is from that uh, perspective that I say that the media has been unfair uh, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, on Yemen, um and that brings us to the United Nations because on October 30th, both James Mattis and Mike Pompeo, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State of the United States, um, suggested uh, something actually that this administration doesn't often suggest, which is to engage with the United Nations to try to settle something. <laughs> and um, they said that, and they praised with justification uh, Martin Griffiths, who is the UN envoy. Um, <coughs> To Saudi Arabia, to Yemen, and uh, and said that uh, they expected there to be first of all Gr Griffiths will be speaking to the Security Council on November 16th, and Mattis and Pompeo said you know, in the next 30 days, days there ought to be an engagement between the Saudi-led coalition and and the Houthis. Since that announcement, the fighting has intensified on both sides, but it has not tailored off it is there has been some, and this is speculation, that both sides are simply trying to gain territory before the moment comes where they have to sit down and talk. Um, can you tell us um, whether Saudi Arabia is now committed, pledged to cooperate with this United Nations venture? The kingdom has been in support of all United Nations efforts to stop the war in the Yemen, and not just the, the Griffiths uh, effort. Uh, or uh, the uh, 
the uh, effort coming out of the Mattis uh, and the Pompeo uh, um, statement. Uh, and yes, uh, the coalition, including the kingdom, uh, has publicly expressed uh, that it will, uh, it will accept uh, whatever efforts Mr. Griffiths undertakes within the context of the statement of uh, Mr. Mattis and uh, Mr. Pompeo. And hopefully the other side will equally comply with these, uh, with these efforts. In all of the previous efforts, it was always the Houthis who never came to the table. Uh, you remember the time in, in, in Kuwait a, few, a couple of years back when there was an effort to get um, the negotiations going. Um, the Houthis simply didn't show up. And so um, I hope that this time they will do that. The tragedy in Yemen is, is extraordinarily painful. Uh, not just for us, but I think for all of uh, mankind. And uh, if anything, yani Yemen needs peace. It doesn't need more warfare. And just another aspect that I would like to, to, to clarify here, and I use your question to do that. In many of your media sources here in America, and perhaps even in Europe, um, they're calling this the Saudi war. It is not the Saudi war. Saudi Arabia is responding to a military takeover by the Houthis and to aid a friendly government, a legitimate government that is recognized by the United Nations, uh, to repel that uh, military takeover. And the United Nations Secur Security Council 2216 has supported the position of supporting the, the legitimate government in the Yemen. So if there are any media around you here and sitting in this room, I hope they will keep that, uh, take that into account and, and uh, call it the Houthis war, not the Saudi war. There are some media sitting in the room, and in a moment we'll go to the room and see if they speak up. Um, uh, I think um, that those were the two main questions I wanted to ask you, and we can move on to other ones. But let me, let me get the room involved. If you would raise your hand, I'll call on you. Um, if we get a number of questions, we'll take two or three at once. I see two. So for anybody else? Um, well, um, and then when, you, uh, when I call on you, please speak to the microphone, identify yourself. This is being webcast, so you have to speak into the microphone so the webcast can hear you. Uh, Edie Letter in the second row. Uh, and thank, thank you very much, Prince Turkey. It's nice to see you again. Edith Likewise. Letter from the Associated Press. Um, going back to Jamal Khashoggi, um, the Secretary General of the United Nations has said repeatedly, including through his spokesman this week, that what is needed is an independent and transparent investigation. And I wonder, um, he believes that this is the only way to really settle this whole issue. Now, you have said that the government is going to do that kind of investigation, but there are many others, including um, Mr. Khashoggi's employers, who have questioned the credibility of Saudi Arabia investigating a killing on its own diplomatic territory. I wonder what your response is to the UN Secretary General's repeated call for an independent, international, transparent investigation. I'm not the one to respond to Mr. Uh, Gutierrez on, on this issue. Uh, I'm not a government official. But what, what I uh, can tell you is that uh, the kingdom is proud of its legal system. Um, it will never accept uh, uh, foreign interference in that system, as other countries have refused to allow uh, in, international tribunals to, to investigate uh, horrific acts that have happened either on their soil or uh, elsewhere committed by their citizens. Um, I just bring uh, an example to you, the, uh, the uh, situation in the prison of Abu Ghraib in, in, in Iraq. Um, U.S. forces committed uh, certain vile acts there, 
And at the time, there was a call for international um, tribunal to do that. But the US went ahead and investigated and reached conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. Other countries have equally held on to their, uh, to their national tribunal system mm -hmm. and, uh, and system of justice to, to carry on with their, uh, with their commitments and their, and their uh, uh, practices. So the kingdom uh, is not going to, to accept uh, an international uh, tribunal to look into uh, something that is Saudi. And uh, the, the Saudi judicial system is, is sound, it is up, it's running, and uh, it, it, it will take its course. Uh, Um, this is, thank you, Prince Turkey. This is Farnas Fasihi from the Wall Street Journal. You said that the um, kingdom um, has made no attempt to cover up what happened to Jamal Khashoggi, yet at the beginning, when he went missing, we heard multiple um, various stories of what had happened to him from Saudi Arabia, uh, and all of them ended up not to be the truth. Can you explain the discrepancy is it even possible that the kingdom does not know what goes on um, in its consulates abroad? And where is his body? Thank you. My, my understanding, of course, and it's not based on, on personal knowledge, but of, of, of um, um, how things develop in, in situations like this, uh, where you have um, information coming in to the responsible authorities about how a certain situation took place. And the, th the authorities believe that that is the, uh, the case, and they come out and affirm that, uh, that, uh, that contention. Uh, subsequently, when more facts come in uh, that uh, show otherwise, that's when um, the authorities review uh, what they had said before and, uh, and uh, bring in this uh, uh, new input from uh, from other sources, etc., and that's how the situation on Khashoggi was uh, was developing. Um, and uh, my 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 view is that there was no attempt to cover up the situation, but that the reporting that had come to the authorities uh, was uh, misleading, and obviously the, those who perpetrated the uh, the crime wanted to to hide what uh, what had happened and to justify what, uh, what they had told uh, the authorities. So uh, I will wait and see what, what's going to happen with the final report that is going to come out that will lay out exactly what happened and, and answer all these questions that have been speculated about and made into uh, tremendous issues. And the body, excuse me. The I wish I could tell you. Yeah, that is going to be part of the reporting that we expect from, uh, from the authorities. In the back. Thank you very much, Prince. Actually, I expect... May I ask who you are, sir? Oh, yes. Uh, this is Mehdi Mirafzal. I am an Iranian, actually, so perhaps... Uh, I... Khuda Hafiz, Mr. Iranian. <laughs> Khuda Hafiz. <laughs> May Allah Hafiz you all. Inshallah. Uh, my question is that you, as the head of a research center on Islamic studies, uh, what you have done in your capacity to unite Muslim to prevent extremism. There are many accusations against Saudi Arabia that Saudi Arabia is behind, especially in countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, encouraging extremism over their Wahhabism or establishing old madrasas. This is uh, my question. So whether you have done, especially in your center, to do something to unite Muslim more rather than to, to divide them. And nowadays, both sides of the Muslim community, both Shia and Sunnis, are being milked by uh, big powers. This is one question. The second question is, your, of course, you are not the governmental official right now, but since you touch upon so many political issues, I wanted to know what is your current uh, stance with regard to Palestine. Saudi Arabia graciously created Islamic cooperation 
organization for the sake of Palestine, actually. And this was the reason death of that organization. But we now see the, your position is departing, and then especially by uh, not r completely recognizing, but being uh, silent on the uh, Jerusalem being uh, capital of uh, Israel. These were two main questions I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two questions. If yes, indeed. Answer, I'll start with the second one, if you don't mind. Uh, the, the kingdom, if you follow its, its official statements and uh, its historic position on Palestine, there has been absolutely no change in that position. Uh, regardless of what you may read in the Washington Post, New York Times, the Jerusalem Post, uh, Haaretz, uh, or whatever um, uh, organ of, of, of media that that reflects, uh, in my view, reflects uh, official Israeli wishful thinking. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu is the one who is behind this, uh, this effort to convince others that uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia are on a course of rapprochement and uh, uh, mutual recognition and so on. And that's not the case. Um, uh, official, uh, just on, on, on Tuesday this week uh, and yesterday, uh, statements coming out uh, of, of Saudi Arabia uh, call on Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories. Uh, the last Arab summit conference uh, in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia last uh, April, I think it was, or, or March, um, King Salman called it the, uh, the, the Jerusalem summit to highlight the fact that uh, the issue of Jerusalem is uh, very much alive in the thinking of not just Saudi Arabia, but Arab countries and, and Muslim countries. And you're right. Uh, the kingdom's efforts to bring uh, Muslims together, the organization of Islamic cooperation now, is, uh, was initiated by, by the kingdom so that uh, all Muslims can come together, Shunna, Sia, uh, and uh, all of the subdivisions uh, thereof. Uh, so uh, that is where the kingdom stands on uh, on Palestine. Uh, on uh, on the King Faisal Center has has um, worked with uh, with religious authorities in the kingdom and outside the kingdom uh, to uh, to further the the uh, the efforts and the idea uh, that uh, our relationship with our uh, sectarian brothers uh, is, is one that is, uh, should be based on our mutual belief in God, our mutual acceptance of Muhammad as his prophet, uh, our mutual uh, belief in the Holy Quran as being our holy book, uh, and our mutual veneration of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, Al al Bayt. Uh, these are principles that uh, not only the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies um, endorses and, and actively promotes uh, in all of its uh, studies, in all of its output, as it were, but also is a reflection of what Saudi Arabia does. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you when the late King Abdullah began his effort uh, to bring the Muslim world together back in uh, 2000 and uh, when was it? 2006, I think, or seven, uh, and he called for a conference uh, of all um, Muslim leaders to be held in Mecca, and uh, um, uh, Sunnis and Shias of all denominations uh, attended that conference, and the one that represented. Uh, Iran at the time was uh, the late president of Sanjani, uh, and uh, they came out with a call that uh, Muslims should engage with non-Muslim religions. Uh, and uh, King Abdullah carried that call, uh, which was uh, reflected by uh, by uh, uh, the former king of Spain, King Juan Carlos, uh, who hosted uh, a conference in Madrid that brought all of the uh, denominations of religions in total, uh, um, uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, you name it. Uh, they all attended that conference in Madrid and uh, King Abdullah addressed it as did uh, King Juan Carlos in, in, in a search to bring religions together and not just 
the different sects in uh, in uh, in Islam. Uh, that conference led to the establishment of a center in Vienna, uh, which deals with uh, bringing all of the religions together. And that center has a board of trustees um, that has uh, um, Jews, Christians, uh, Muslims, uh, Hindus, etc., um, including the Vatican uh, that supported the effort. Uh, and it is uh, called the King Abdullah Center for Religious and Cultural um, uh, Dialogue. Um, and so uh, this is where the center, the King Faisal Center, follows from that, uh, from that, uh, from that uh, effort on, on the part of Saudi Arabia. As far as accusations about Saudi Arabia uh, supporting uh, so-called Wahhabi uh, madrasas and things like that, I had the the the, the, pro, uh, the pleasure and 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 the privilege of meeting with uh, a former U.S. Uh, senator, um, and uh, at the time, soon after uh, September 11th, uh, 2002, precisely, uh, in which he addressed me and said, uh, uh, "Why is Saudi Arabia supporting these so-called Wahhabi madrasas and so on?" And I told him. Senator, the kingdom is targeted by these groups, so it would be not only foolish, but downright stupid to, to support people who want to bring you down. And I asked him if he could give me a list of these so-called uh, Wahhabi madrasas and schools, etc., that the kingdom uh, was supporting, so that I could convey it to responsible authorities in the kingdom and they can take action. Um, as we were leaving, and he promised to do that, as we were leaving his office, one of his aides was walking out with me. And, and I turned to him and I said, uh, Mr. So I can't remember his name now, but I said, can you make sure to send me uh, this list of, uh, of schools and, and so on? And he turned to me quite directly and he said, I'm sorry, that's classified information. <laughs> so uh, this is, and he, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. And, and let me just remind you, sir, you come from Iran, you say, and so on. It is Iran that is, that is uh, collecting um, uh, people like Hezbollah. Uh, you know there is not just Hezbollah in the Lebanon, but you know there is a Hezbollah in the Hejaz, uh, which uh, undertook the, the uh, the Khobar Towers uh, explosion back in 1996. There is a Hezbollah of the Kuwait that tried to assassinate the Emir of Kuwait during the Iraq-Iran war, etc., etc. Um, that is an activity that Iran undertakes openly uh, to recruit uh, such uh, people who, uh, who go on to undertake actions uh, like that. The kingdom never recruited people like that. And if you can give me a list of these so-called madrasas in Pakistan that the kingdom is supposedly helping to promote uh, disunity and, and extremism, uh, I will equally relay that to, to the authorities. But please, don't tell me it is classified information. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a few questions about um, Abdullah bin Salman. Uh, the, uh, he and his... 2030 reform program have attracted enormous amount of attention, uh, much of it positive. Um, the aspect that got the most attention here in the popular press, of course, was granting women the right to drive. Subsequently, there were women arrested in the kingdom for advocating for that right. Can you explain that apparent contradiction? Uh, uh, there is no contradiction if you follow Saudi statements on that. Mm -hmm. Um, the women who were arrested subsequently uh, were arrested for other reasons, not because they were advocating for the driving uh, of women. Uh, and uh, the prince had an interview with Bloomberg, I don't know if you saw it uh, early, early October, where he was asked this question. And he proposed to the, uh, to the Bloomberg team that was interviewing him that they should go and, and meet with the attorney general in Saudi Arabia and see what were the, the reasons for the arrest of these uh, women and other per, uh, persons as well. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if Bloomberg did that or not, uh, but, but if they didn't, and I assume that His Highness was not being flippant about this, that he is serious about it, uh, I'm sure people can follow it up. So uh, this is what I can tell you, Yanni, the, that uh, the, the official Saudi statements on the arrests of those people is that uh, they are charged with, with crimes. Uh, I don't know what those crimes are because I'm not uh, privy to, to the, uh, to the uh, affair, but uh, uh, check with the, with, the, with, with the crown prince himself. The, the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, as you have said yourself, has brought a lot of unwanted attention um, to the kingdom. Uh, not all of it, I would argue, from knee-jerk demonizers of Saudi Arabia. Um, my question is, what effect has that had on the leadership of the prince in Saudi Arabia itself, among the Saudi public, in the royal family? Um, his Royal Highness, as you know, was chosen as crown prince by the king. And he has the full uh, support of the king who delegated him uh, to undertake uh, issues like, for example, uh, the um, social and economic development of the kingdom in the form of Vision 2030. That yes. included the issue of women, etc., and the other social and, uh, and economic uh, um, developments in, in the kingdom. Uh, and as far as I can tell, Yanni, the, 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 king's, um, uh, the king's authority that he delegated to, uh, to Prince Mohammed is unchanged. Uh, and uh, I think there was uh, an article in, in one of the, your American newspapers, whether it was the Times or the Washington Post, about uh, a visit to, to, uh, to the hinterland in Saudi Arabia and, and meeting uh, people outside the capital of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And, and he asked them uh, their view of Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and, and they were extremely supportive of Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And this is what I told uh, our friend David Ignatius, our mutual friend, uh, when he interviewed me. And he, the prince is not regarded uh, as, as anything but a, uh, a reformer, uh, and as a, a person who, who will do uh, what he promised to do, which was uh, to uh, um, um, improve the lot of Saudis in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the more that he is attacked in the media and speculated upon uh, by particularly Western media, uh, the more he gets support among the people and uh -huh. among the Saudi family, mm -hmm. the Saudi royal family. Um, not just for that reason, but because they feel that he is unjustifiably um, uh, victimized by, by this media. Mm -hmm. And along the same lines, we saw, um, I never resist a question from uh, our friend in the front row here, but let me just ask you one question. Who can resist Raghid al uh, man? <laughs> <laughs> Raghid Adurham, you'll get your moment in a second. I just want to ask you one further question sure. about the aftermath of the killing of Khashoggi and its effect on Saudi Arabia. Uh, we saw that there were some principal people who backed out of that sovereign wealth um, fund conference in Riyadh. Um, has the aftermath, the, the Saudi involvement in the killing of Khashoggi, has this affected um, the uh, capacity of Saudi Arabia to remain a global technology investor, uh, to attract investment to the kingdom? I cannot say, and sitting from here and uh, not being in, in, the, in the loop, if you like, yes. uh, of the Saudi Investment Authority or the Saudi Investment Fund. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, the, the conference that was uh, not attended by some of these people uh, led to the signing, as I read in the papers in Saudi Arabia, of more than $50 billion worth of projects with international, um, uh, international uh, consortiums and international uh, business uh, groups. Um, and the kingdom's ongoing um, uh, engagement with, uh, with businesses and with, um, with uh, um, uh, industries and so on will continue. 
that is not, I think, will be affected by the absence of uh, some, some of these so-called um, uh, magnates. Uh, but, uh, um, and the report that I saw recently put out by the International Monetary Fund on, on Saudi Arabia's uh, Vision 2030 accomplishments has been very encouraging. Yeah, and the International Monetary Fund believes that the program is going forward, uh, that it is going, uh, uh, doing things that were not expected to be done. And so um, um, people are looking up. And if you look at the stock market in Saudi Arabia, it is reflecting that, uh, that confidence in, uh, in, in, uh, in the condition of, of the Saudi economy. In the front row. Thank you, Your Highness. Thanks, thanks Warren. Uh, Your Highness, you Pardon were... Me, just introduce yourself. I'm Raghi Dadarham, uh, yep. founder and executive chairman of Beirut Institute and columnist with The National. Uh, you were in Washington last week, as I was, having gathered a lot of in, in probably information and also analysis of what are the expectations beyond the second round of sanctions being imposed on Iran. What... What are you expecting? Uh, do, are we expecting that the Iranian government will um, weather its behavior and there will be a change of uh, behavior as the administration is saying? Or are you worried that the Revolutionary Guards will choose escalation? If so, where do you expect that to be? Sort of give, give us a read, if you would, in what do you see coming to the region in the next few months as a result of the sanctions? And do you think the fact that the Democrats got the House, the majority in the House, will impact the foreign policy of uh, President Trump uh, one way or another, maybe to the extent of probably backing away a bit from pressuring Iran? Can you share the long term as well as the, sh the, the immediate well, I wish I had a crystal ball that I can look into and, and predict what's going to happen. Uh, I don't, but I, I do listen to people. And as you mentioned, uh, I met with people in Washington. Uh, and uh, I read what ha comes out in the, in the media and I hear what comes out in statements and so on. Um, the, the, the Trump spokesmen, as I heard them on, on radio and, and seen them on television and read them in the papers, um, have consistently said that their aim is not regime change in, uh, in Iran, but rather uh, change of conduct. And uh, that uh, Iran has a choice, or rather the leadership of Iran has a choice. Uh, either it changes its conduct vis-a-vis -vis its interference in Arab affairs, its support for, for terrorist uh, activities. And we just saw recently the, the, the matter of Denmark uh, being um, uh, a place where uh, the targeting of Iranian dissidents was uh, undertaken by, uh, by Iranian officials. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait and see how the Iranian reaction is going to be uh, to these uh, sanctions or to, these, uh, to the return of the sanctions that had been lifted before. Um, and uh, what was the other part of your question? Yeah, please, yeah, wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. So I was wondering if you think the, revo rev the revolutionary guards would take to escalation as a response. Would that be in Lebanon? What shape would it take? Would it be in Syria? Would it be in, 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 uh, in Yemen? Uh, and, and I was wondering if the elections, the midterm elections, ah. would have an impact. So two more points. Well, the conduct of the IRGC, I cannot speculate on it. Um, they, can, they can look, uh, perhaps, and see that uh, their, their their economic base is going to be um, uh, shrunk by these, uh, by these uh, uh, sanctions, and therefore uh, they will not accept that, and maybe they will take some, uh, be more aggressive in their response uh, to it, or they can reach the conclusion that it is better to become part of the world community and give up on some of the extraterritorial ambitions that I had mentioned um, in, my, uh, in my presentation. As far as the Democrats are concerned, 
Um, again, uh, I don't, I cannot foretell what they will do, but uh, I've seen uh, statements, for example, by the new, uh, the, 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 new the, the to be newly appointed head of the of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate, a Democrat, Mr. Dingle, I think his name is. Um, whose view of Iran is uh, very similar to President Trump's view of Iran. Um, so if that is a reflection of, of where Democrats that have come in and have acquired uh, responsible positions as a result of the, of the elections are going to be, then I can't see that there is going to be any change there. Yes, please, there in the... Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Edward Flynn. I'm senior human rights officer with the uh, Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate. Um, Your Highness, uh, of course, Saudi Arabia has been very clear that it does not support international terrorism, and it's been a strong participant in international counterterrorism efforts. Um, at the same time, the kingdom has uh, stated, and it's no secret, that uh, a, a large number of Saudis have, in fact, turned to terrorism or violent extremism. And, in fact, in the kingdom, there are uh, many thousands of prosecutions um, for that uh, offense. Would you have any uh, thoughts on what might be the conditions or the factors which end up leading or driving uh, quite a few Saudi citizens to uh, international or national, for that matter, terrorism and, and violent extremism? Unfortunately, the, the attraction of these groups, violent groups and, and uh, terrorist groups, uh, is not confined to Saudis. Uh, it is broad-based. Uh, you will find representation in them from, uh, from, from all over the world. And there are Americans who have gone, gone that route. There are Europeans who have gone that route. There are Chinese who have gone that route. There are Japanese, etc. Um, we in the kingdom recognize that we've had a problem, uh, and that problem was the, the, some of our young people were uh, attracted by, by this kind of extremist uh, uh, ideology and uh, extremist uh, philosophy. And so uh, we took action. Uh, first of all, we, we reviewed uh, our, our, all of our um, uh, mosque preaching practices to make sure that no extremist um, ideology or, or uh, uh, philosophy uh, can be broadcast through the pulpit, the, the religious pulpit, in the mosques. And if you, if you review the statements that came out in, uh, since and even before September 11, uh, 2001, uh, several, um, or I would say scores, if not more than that, of mosque preachers were fired or re, re, uh, put in rehabilitation areas uh, to, uh, to review their, their, uh, their, uh, their philosophy and, and their ideology. Uh, in schools as well, yeah, and the, the curricula has been uh, transforming over the years. Uh, I remember when I was ambassador in, 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 in Washington, um, uh, uh, it was brought to my attention that some of the textbooks that were being taught in, in, in the Saudi-supported school in Virginia at the time had, uh, had some, uh, some objectionable uh, terminology as far as extremism and things like that. Uh, so I commissioned our, 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 our people from the education office to review those textbooks, and we did find some, some uh, paragraphs and some sentences that could be interpreted by a teacher who inclined that way to, go, to promote uh, extremism and, and, uh, and other negative aspects. And we had them removed immediately from, from the school in, uh, in, uh, in Virginia. And likewise is happening in, in, in the kingdom and has happened. So there's been a revamping of, of the scholastic uh, uh, um, uh, 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 syllabuses and and uh, and uh, uh, textbooks in in the kingdom uh, in the past few years. Uh, other issues on the media, for example, whether on television or on radio and so on, uh, the kingdom through 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 that uh, um, that outlet um, uh, promotes the uh, the the uh, the. Uh, 
um, uh, anti-extremist uh, uh, philosophy and uh, and uh, uh, ideology of uh, of Islam. Uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed, of course, uh, alluded to that or, or said so um, uh, straightforwardly in his statements uh, in the past year and a half that we will not accept extremist ideology in, in, in the kingdom and we will fight it, not just in the kingdom but throughout the world. And if you remember when President Trump made his historic visit to the kingdom, um, uh, he inaugurated with King Salman <coughs> the center to counter uh, extremist ideology and, uh, and uh, philosophy. Uh, and uh, just a, a remark on, on the counter-terrorism center at the United Nations, uh, which many people don't know, is, is funded by Saudi Arabia. And, and it was Saudi Arabia's idea to establish that center in the first place. Going back to 2005, imagine. Uh, it took about 11 years before that center was finally set up at the United Nations. And I'm glad to see that uh, someone is doing something about it there, because uh, we need that. We need to have the world come together, uh, not only to share intelligence, but also to share know-how and to share uh, financial burden. Uh, that is something, I think, that will go a long way to meet the challenge that faces all of us. We have just a minute more, but I see no further hands, so please join me in thanking Prince Turki for coming here, taking our questions, and explaining the Saudi point of view to us. Thank you. Thank you. You've been very great.